Good morning, you're watching All You Need to Know on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First, the headlines this morning. Asian markets are off to a muted start as investors look for cues from corporate earnings and global growth. Piyush Goel gets additional charge of Finance Ministry in uh, Arun Jetli's absence. Goel will also present the vote on accounts scheduled for the 1st of February. The tariff war should be over by the end of 2019, according to Bharti Airtel Chairman Sunil Mittal. Anand Mahindra says the need to be seen as a local player in the overseas markets M&M caters to has prompted the company to set up assembly lines in new geographies like the US and South Africa. And Yes Bank, along with Ultratech Cement, will be the two nifty majors reporting their third quarter numbers today. Let's talk about the US markets now. US stocks ended the day with gains following another rocky session on Wednesday, rebounding from their Tuesday drops after a batch of strong earnings reports. The dollar's six-day rally stalled and crude oil dropped after an earlier increase. Taylor Riggs of Bloomberg News tells you everything that happened in that Wall Street session in this report. I'm Taylor Riggs with a look at the U.S. markets on Wednesday. We had a pretty volatile day. We were fluctuating really all day long between gains and losses. We managed to end across the board in the green. The Dow Jones is up, close up about 175 points or seven tenths of 1%. You had the S&P 500 up about two tenths of 1% and the NASDAQ mostly flat, trying to eke out some gains. The transportation index is really where it, the, a lot of the action was happening today. You had the Dow Jones transportation index really falling at one point, looking like it was going to close down almost about 1%. When we were talking to traders about the volatility that we saw today, we spoke with Scott Bauer. He's down at the SIBO over in Chicago. He said there just wasn't a lot of conviction in the rally. You still have a lot of earnings coming ahead. And so people not really confident that this rally was sustainable. That's a little bit why you're seeing some of the mixed action today. I mentioned the Dow Transportation Index because we got a lot of headlines about that. Some of the losses, the big lo losers in that index were UPS and FedEx. You have UPS, one of the worst performers. It was off about 2% today. This is after a report from the Wall Street Journal that Amazon was looking at lowering the fees that it pays to some of these traditional carriers like a UPS and a FedEx, looking at perhaps becoming a competitor and looking at some new shipping carriers or looking at starting up its own shipping service. And so there are some concerns, of course, with the Amazon effect when they come in and disrupt a market. And so UPS and FedEx did indeed uh, close lower. Another sector that we were really watching today because we've talked so much about earnings was the consumer staples. And this was very interesting because you had sort of a tale of two consumer staples here, Procter & Gamble and Kimberly Clark. Procter & Gamble, they closed almost 4% higher. They had a top and a bottom line beat. And they'd forecast their full year sales uh, revised it higher by about 1%. This was in stark contrast to what we heard from the Kimberly Clark CEO when he said that he was facing pressure on margins, higher commodity costs coming in, having to try to pass those costs onto the consumer and facing, quote, a very challenging environment. So this does indeed confirm what we've been really hearing from a lot of analysts that we're in a stock picker's market, that you can't really go on the sector as a whole, uh, but you're really having to dive down and differentiate between these different stocks within a specific sector. You certainly saw that play out today within Procter & Gamble and the divergence with Kimberly Clark. I want to round out the asset classes because so much of the focus has been on equities, of course, here on Wednesday. Uh, but let's take a look at the VIX because it actually ended up closing down lower before below the 20 handle with the 19 um, on Tuesday when it had closed above 20 on the VIX. That was the first time it, it had since January 8th. So some good news here that that fear gauge is starting to come down and head a little bit lower. And then, of course, with the appetite for some risky assets with equities ending in the green, you had bond yields come in, uh, rise really price lower, yield higher. 10 year was up about one basis point to 275, while the 30 year up again about one basis point to a 307. And that's a look at your U.S. markets on Wednesday. Now, one of the big concerns facing global markets has been global growth. Now, the International Monetary Fund has cut its global growth forecast for 2019 and 20. However, Managing Director Christine Lagarde does not see signs of a recession anytime soon. She spoke to Bloomberg Television at the World Economic Forum in Davos, where she highlighted the two major risks to global growth. Listen in. 
Today, our forecast is 3.5, yeah. 3.6 next year. And if you ask me, do you see a recession? I say no. OK? So if there was to be materialization of the risks that we see on the horizon, and the point is that this horizon is getting a little bit closer to what we had back in October, that's the reason why we slightly revised our growth forecast. If those risks were to materialize, then it's a different story. And you ask me which one of the risks uh, I rank higher, I would say that the trade tension, if unresolved, and if associated with a big question mark, would be my number one risk. Yeah. I think Brexit uncertainty and the big question mark yet again that we have on how it's going to be resolved, what is the time frame, what is the after divorce uh, situation. I would put that as number two, but with probably um, major impact on the UK, um, impact on the European Union, systemic ris risks if the financial sector is not addressed. Um, and then I would have as a sort of subset of that first risk, in other words, trade tensions continuing to uh, increase, I would have uh, an accelerated moderation of growth in China. All right, let's turn now to the Asian markets. Most of them have opened up. Sophie Kamrudir of Bloomberg News is joining us live from Hong Kong. Uh, good morning, Sophie. Any clear cues that you're picking up that will take us through trade today at the start today? Well, as we heard earlier from our correspondent from the U.S., it really is a stock picker's market. So we're seeing some divergent themes today. Asian stocks edging higher after a two-day decline with earnings and central bank decisions coming into play. We had the Bank of Korea holding on its key rate as expected. And the BOK said GDP growth will likely be slightly below its October projection. Now, Korean shares are the best performers in the region, led higher by semiconductor-related players. SK Hynix is rising after announcing a 50% increase in dividends, offsetting then the softer-than-expected fourth-quarter earnings. In Tokyo, the Nikkei 225 is fluctuating, while the yen is steady after sliding on Wednesday on the BOJ cutting its inflation forecast. Australian shares are halting a two-day decline, while the Aussie dollar is climbing after the December jobs report beat estimates. And in Hong Kong, the Hang Seng swinging between gains and losses. We have a drag coming through from Tencent as well as from Macau Casino operations. Operators this after we had disappointing results from Las Vegas Sands. And the Shanghai Composite now looking little changed. We do then have perhaps a second day of small gains for the index on the mainland in China. Back to you. Uh, well, thanks so much for that, uh, Sophie. Let's talk about some of the news that you'll find if you look up the website, uh, BloombergQuint.com, and we'll soon take you through, of course, the trade setup for the day in India. Well, First of all, the Board of India's largest telecom operator approved the proposal to raise close to 25,000 crore rupees, the bulk of it coming from promoters Vodafone Group and, in fact, Aditya Birla Group. Vodafone Idea is looking to raise funds, uh, and this is according to the uh, notification that they sent to the stock exchanges via a rights issue, and the infusion is expected to be completed by March. And the second update, of course, is the fact that IDBI Bank's rating has been upgraded by Moody's Investor Services by as much as three notches. And while it still remains in the non-investment category, uh, it is a significant development and the outlook on its debt obligations going forward have been uh, turned to positive. And this all is on the back, of course, of that infusion of funds by the new promoter LIC. All right, with that, let's turn to Agam Vakil, who's joining us with the trade setup for the day in India and also to tell you what's happening in the futures and options space. Agam, good morning. What's on your list? Good morning, Alex. Well, it seems like the SGX Nifty is, uh, well, bucking the trend right now with the global weakness that we've seen right now. Uh, well, the SGX Nifty is indicating an up more around 23 points. Uh, how did our markets fare yesterday? Well, uh, a lot of weakness seeping in, but the benchmarks were a lot weaker than um, the mid-cap and the small-cap indices in the broader markets. And the nifty banking indices, too, well, took a little bit of a hit. PSU banking index specifically down around 1.3%. But let's talk about your American depository receipts among stocks which are well, listed abroad. Vipro, Vedanta, Tata Motors and Dr. Reddy's advancing in trade. And 
We have HDFC Bank and ICICI Bank declining to a certain extent, but not too much. Infosys, of course, remains largely unchanged. Uh, foreign institutional flows, well, FIS selling 780 or crores on a net basis, 580, 584 crores worth of stock bought by DIs again on a net basis. But uh, moving on to your contributors, 91 point decline. A bulk of those losses were contributed by ITC itself, which declined by over 4% yesterday. HDFC Infosys and HDFC uh, Limited Bank as well, all bearing down on the indices and not too much help from Sun Pharma, HUR and Yes Bank for that matter. But uh, moving on to your futures and options space, so we're looking at uh, well, uh, an accumulation of uh, as much as 3% towards shorts in the Nifty. And the Nifty banking futures too, the picture isn't any different. 6% added there in open interest. But um, let's move on and talk about your open interest distribution. Now, this is where things are getting a bit patchy, uh, considering the change in the range that we are working with. It's at, Well, it's mostly 10,500 where you have max OI. But on the upper end, it's 11,000. And after yesterday's weakness, we did see a lot of unwinding inputs. And speaking of that change, uh, you know, as you guys one might imagine, we've seen unwinding in 10,700, 500, or rather 900 puts, and considerable writing around the 10,900 and 11,000 calls. But uh, let's move on and talk about your wicks. That's up as much as 0.6% well, at around 18. And your Nifty put call ratio, well, it's come off to around 1.43. Nifty banking put call ratio at 0.86. And uh, well, among uh, your FNO band, we have Jet Airways and Reliance Capital, which remain in there. Uh, we do have Gen Irrigation, which moves into the band. Adani Power, on the other hand, moves out of the FNO band. And uh, moving on to other stocks, we have ICICI Prudential, severe weakness, 79% added in open interest. A lot of shorts building up there. ITC is the other one with 22% added towards uh, fresh selling coming along. Apollo Hospitals, well, it's flat, but con accumulation continues. TVS Motor Company is the other stock which is wilting on the pressure. And talk about, uh, well, unwinding. And uh, again, Torrent Power, KPID, Tech and Reliance Capital, among some others, which do stand out. But uh, if you consider the broader markets, Alex, it wasn't exactly a good day of trade. And uh, of course, the benchmarks were under pressure largely because of a handful of, uh, well, uh, you know, heavyweighted stocks. Thanks so much for that, Agam. Well, let's uh, turn to one of the big updates from last evening. Piyush Goyal uh, and not Arun Jaitley will present the existing government's uh, last financial document. The president, on advice from the prime minister, gave the railway minister interim charge of the finance ministry yesterday. Nikunj Ori is joining us on the phone line for more. Nikunj, good morning. What are the details of that communication from uh, the ministry yesterday? And are there any details about the present condition of, uh, uh, well, now, uh, Union Minister Arun Jaitley? Uh, Railways Minister Piyush Goel has been appointed as the additional, has been given the additional charge of Finance and Corporate Affairs Ministry till the leave of absence of Mr. Arun Jaitley. Uh, Arun Jaitley, according to reports, underwent a surgery for soft tissue cancer in his thigh and has been advised to rest for around two weeks. Meanwhile, Mr. Goel will present the NDA government's last budget before the election and Mr. Jaitley will continue as a cabinet minister without a portfolio in the Modi government. Over to you. It's been a tough uh, 10 years. Yes. With the 2008, 10 new licenses being given, lots more people investing, ruling out networks, maniacal uh, you know, competition in the marketplace. And then comes one new operator, Geo, and then you see most of them disappearing. 45, 50 billion dollars written off, loss of jobs lost. But I mean, if you put all that uh, you know, behind now, the kind of dark clouds, there's three players left for a nation of the size of India. Mm -hmm. 1.3 billion people. You have now served by three operators. And three more or less equi size at the moment, with Vodafone idea settling to now 30s, Geo rising to 30 plus, and we are staying at 31, 32 percent. So you have three equi sites, and there will be some readjustment. Geo wants more stay, more market share. It's driving a lot of subsidies in the marketplace, trying to you know, go into areas uh, uh, with 4G networks where others have not gone. So it's a, still a competitive environment out there, great for the customers, mm -hmm. but uh, not so good for the industry at the moment. But one has to 
be hopeful that given the market structure has corrected, uh, sooner than later things will start to get better. In fact, that's exactly what I was going to ask you because you know I think we've had multiple conversations here in Davos on the market structure yes. and the industry structure yeah. and the times when we had several players, dozens, <laughs> and then you know you said maybe it's, uh, six or five is yeah. the global average. India has now settled at lower than that, which is about three, yeah. but it yet doesn't seem like a financially viable or healthy structure. Is that a 2019 change that may take place, or do you think that this disruption? will continue for the next two or three years. My, you know, it's very hard to predict you know, what others will do, but I would say, given the lay of the land, 2019 should be a year of uh, uh, stopping the dreadful decline. Mm -hmm. Will it be a year of recovery? Possibly not. A year of recovery could be 2020. Uh, and this is a year where you have to invest more, get out more into the markets for 4G, compete in the marketplace, hold on to your market share, hold on to your better customer. So I would say this will be a year of perhaps hemorrhaging stopping. Perhaps. Yes. But you still don't feel confident enough to say this. It's hard to say. Eventually, one player is uh, playing a low tariff game, high subsidy game. It has to be his call. It's interesting you say that, Mr. Mittal. Forever you've been the market leader. Forever mm -hmm. you've taken the market where it needs to be. And today somebody else is dictating that. What has the shift been like in these last two or three years? No. I'm asking more from a personal, <laughs> man, strategic, managerial point of view as well. You have been the evangelist of this industry and now somebody else is setting the terms. But I've always said that. You know, people who were the leaders yesterday cannot you know, have a guarantee that they will remain leaders of today and today's leaders can't be leaders of tomorrow. This shift happens. All I have consistently said is, when the chips will fall, we will be the last man standing. I've always said that. Okay. And to that extent, I'm very proud of what we have developed. It's a homegrown, uh, you know, company. We have spent over 45, 50 billion dollars building Airtel. It's one of the finest machines, great brand, great management teams out there. And we will be the last man standing because the company is still in a great shape. Uh, Africa is stabilized. Uh, India, parts of India have stabilized. Some more turbulence will happen in the fixed broadband side. Mm. And uh, that is yet to play out. But do keep in mind, seven, eight quarters of mobile, absolute mayhem. We have stood firm. Were we disappointed last year? Yes, the entire industry was. It's all had by now that we that the festival sales belied our expectations. So we were hoping for a really robust kicker in the festival season. I won't even go over why they may not have happened. In hindsight, it's, you know, you have many, many reasons. But it'll be interesting to know how you read the situation because then it'll give us a sense of some of those reasons. I, I, you know, it, look, it was, it was the fact that there was a rate hike. It was the fact that there was the, the, the monsoon didn't turn out to be as good as one hoped. There were the state elections. All these things are trotted out. At the end of the day, it all translates into poor sentiment of the consumer. Okay. <clears throat> And we are hoping that that sentiment will revive next year, I mean the next year, this year, we are in, the, in the months to come, I'm a great believer that there is a huge pent-up demand that is waiting to come out. Will it come out before the elections? Again, I don't know. I'm a perpetual student like all of us of the Indian psyche and how it behaves. But you never know. You know, we launched this Java bike, for example. And it sold out. So, Tell me there's a paucity in demand. We had to announce that. But we are it's a very board. different, very positioned category. You know, I you're, think a lot of business is going to be like that. <clears throat> it's going to be about differentiation, about brands, about. It always the, has been, right? Hasn't that always been your mantra? It's going to be even more our mantra, but I'm saying more and more if you look at the millennial nature. Hmm. Millennials want brands that speak to them directly, that have meaning for them, whatever the narrative. They want special narratives. So in that sense, not just us, but even mass market companies are going to have to find ways to segment. And all I'm saying is that we are taking, yes, just one segment. But I'm saying there is, there is capacity. These are not cheap bikes. So people just, uh, when they find the right narrative, there is money. So I hope 2019 will be the year when the money comes out. Well, it's the second a cement company, Ultratech, which will be reporting its December quarter numbers. But unlike Shree Cement, we aren't expecting good set of numbers coming in from Ultratech Cement. On the face of it, basic numbers might just appear strong. But then the weak prices may weigh down on the realizations and EBITDA per ton performance of the company. Basic numbers, revenue, we're expecting a 13% uptick there, YOI basis. EBITDA is expected to be higher by more than 12%. 12 and the profitability of the company, too, is seen increasing by as much as 18%. Volume growth 
growth is expected to be higher by 11% and realization, however, are expected to remain flattish, uh, uptake of uh, around 2% to a level of around 4,900 per tonne. And in terms of EBITDA per tonne, again, a flattish load, a growth expected there to a number of around 811 as compared to 800 rupees that we've seen in the corresponding quarter of the previous year. The ramp of uh, acquired JP acquisition has mainly uh, expected to ramp up the volume growth of the company, but then the cost pressures are expected to weigh down on the unitary performance of the company. Also got to do with the fact that the realization of the company are expected to remain weak due to the weak pricing power that the South region currently is facing along with that of North. Though uh, that might be offset to an extent by the kind of price hike that Central region has taken in this one uh, complete year uh, where Ultratech uh, is, which, which is also Ultratech's key operating market. But then overall we expecting a muted sort of realization and unitary performance coming in by the company. Key things that we like to watch out for would be the commentary in terms of the pricing, which is a, a key parameter for cement companies, and also the input cost pressures guidance, given that most of these input pressures have now started receding. Yes, Bank will also come out with its numbers today. We are seeing an NI growth of close to 33% and a profit growth of just 1% for the bank this time around. What are the certain factors that you need to watch out for? First of all, expect loan growth to moderate, even though it will be as high as 40% compared to the other quarters. Uh, previously, that will slow down. And expect loan book to remain rather, rather flattish this time around. Deposit growth is also expected to remain healthy for the bank this time around. NIMs will remain largely flattish due to the MCLR increase. And and margins should stabilize at Q on Q level by close to 3.3%. Fee income growth should moderate given the base effect and uh, slippages and exposure to ILNFS needs to be watched out for uh, Yes Bank this time around. Uh, some other things that you need to watch out for. First of all, there will we need clarity on the update of the CEO succession plan. That is important. Update on capital raising plans in any. Uh, update on ILNFS exposure, recovery and potential slippages from this account. And finally, loan growth and margin trajectory going forward is something that you need to watch out for Yes Bank today. Well, apart from these two earnings, bunch of news that we'd be taking uh, an eye out on would be a uh, few of earnings which have come after market hours. PD Light, which is not uh, reportedly, uh, you know, has uh, registered a good set of numbers, bad set of numbers rather, coming in from the company on consolidated basis. Top line growth, a 19% uptick there. Margins, however, contracted for the company at 18% as compared to 24%. And the net profitability of the company, too, has declined by as much as 8.5%, despite an healthy volume growth registered by the company, uh, almost 11% growth out there on standalone basis, mainly on account of cost inflation pressures, which is way down on the operational performance of the company. United Spirits, a steady quarter, but then lower than what the street was estimating with. Revenue, we're looking at, uh, we saw an uptick of 10%. Margins of the company expanded to 14% as compared to 12%. An exceptional outgo of nearly 20 odd crore was witnessed in this quarter. Despite that, the profitability of the company came up to more than 42% as compared at the number of around 192 crore. Uh, Thirumalai uh, Chemicals, well, not a good set of numbers reported by the company. Though the company registered on the top line growth itself, we saw a down thing coming in there, 6% decline uh, in the revenues. EBITDA too was down by 66% and the net profitability was uh, impacted by 77% at 11 crore as compared to 51 crore in the corresponding quarter. Higher raw material costs along with uh, the lower outgroup, uh, low prices led to disappointing set of numbers from Thirumalai. Everest industry steady quarter reported by the car by the company revenue up by five percent margin at seven percent as compared to six point five percent and we're also looking at a couple of corporate news IDBI bank where Moody's has upgraded ratings of the bank instruments uh, in view of the capital infusion by LIC and persistent system which is going to be considering a buyback proposal on Jan 27. Baldil's out there uh, had the cable where not Bank has sold in more than two and a half percent stake in the company after reporting after the company reported uh, the kind of earnings in the December quarter and Ratnamani metal tubes where again Nalanda India, which has been on a selling streak since yesterday, sold in more than one and a half percent stake in the counter.